We want to go now to Gaza because mm. right now in Gaza there is no electricity. The head of the power authority tells CNN that the one power station has run out of fuel and that it's no longer working. It's part of Israel's promised siege of the Palestinian enclave. And of course, the death, death toll in Gaza, as we have it, above 1,000 people, injuries mounting above 5,000 now, all this together making the humanita humanitarian situation there even more dire for civilians. Gaza's hospitals and morgues, we are told, are filling up. CNN's Sama Abdelaziz is following the story from London. Sama, tell us what you're learning from the Gaza side of this story. And you've just revealed some of those numbers, uh, more than 1,000 killed so far. One in 10 Gazans, over uh, nearly a quarter million people essentially have been displaced from their homes. Hospitals say that they're running on generator power, but soon they'll run out of fuel. Morgues are overwhelmed. People have nowhere to go. And all of this is only the beginning of a lengthy conflict. Uh, you heard there from our colleague Jeremy Diamond speaking about the reservists on the ground. So far, all you're seeing is Israel's air Assault, a continuous battering of the strip. You haven't yet seen a ground encourage, and of course, that's highly expected and would only amplify the suffering there. It's important to know that there are about two million Gazans, two million people who are trapped in that tiny coastal strip. There is, even before this conflict, a blockade that's existed there for more than 15 years. It, it imposes travel restrictions that make it nearly impossible for most average people to leave. And you have to remember that Hamas treats Gaza like it is its own backyard. There have been no elections in Gaza uh, for many, many years now since uh, Hamas seized control in 2007. So the people there have no say in what Hamas does, but they absolutely bear the brunt of the, consequ of the consequences of this conflict. You already have rights groups ringing the alarm, saying that the siege that Israel has imposed, cutting off food, cutting off fuel, cutting off water, that that is collective punishment, that it is a violation of international law. But Israel is undeterred. The defense minister was on the border just a few hours ago meeting with Israeli troops, saying the gloves are off. There are no restraints. Gaza will never be the same again. Of course, these words are haunting the many families right now living under bombardment. Is there any sense now when we look at these strikes, is Israel still giving warning of the strikes in advance to allow for civilians to move uh, from the buildings, their homes, uh, or elsewhere before the bombs drop? I think what you're referencing is the knock on the door. Yeah. It's actually a form of strike that you know mm -hmm. in the past has been used on homes to give them some warning. Actually, an Israeli official was asked about that by CNN, and his response was, well, Hamas did not give us a knock before they carried out their surprise attack, before they carried out their assault. So the answer sort of vaguely there being no. Civilians are not being given a heads up. We've also heard eyewitness accounts of the same on the ground. Uh, Israeli officials have also been asked about cutting off food, cutting off fuel, cutting off water. Uh, is this not collective punishment? And their response has also been, we cannot be expected to provide for uh, the Gaza Strip while we are at war with the Gaza Strip. And that's absolutely the problem here. Again, two million people trapped in this deeply impoverished enclave, absolutely caught in the middle. They have no say when Hamas fires a rocket, but they will get the vengeance for it. Mm. Yeah. And Sama, we've been hearing just awful stories of people who were in Gaza who say, you know, they hear from the authorities, go to the south, they go to the south, and then the south is hit with airstrikes. They hear from authorities, go to the north, and then the north. And so, you know, for all of the folks that are in Gaza, more than 2 million people, um, just, just really difficult days ahead. Sama Abdelaziz, thank you, Sama. And Christian is <clears throat> on the other side of the screen. We can see as the sun is setting um, in Gaza, you can see just how dark it is as they main the one and only power station in Gaza reports that the power is out and generators that are there, they will have or will soon be running out of fuel. This is our first look at what power out in Gaza is going to mean. And to your point about how civilians that want to get out of harm's way, want to get out of Gaza, what they're up against in doing so. Um, there are these third party talks about potentially getting humanitarian corridors out. An IDF spokesperson was on with us earlier this earlier in the show, and I asked her where she where the IDF thinks that civilians in Gaza should go if they want to get out of the out of harm's way. Let me play what she said. 
first, I would say that if they do receive any kind of advance warning, to simply put distance from where they are and go somewhere else, even within the street. Um, and beyond that, there is another border that the Gaza Strip has with Egypt, and I, you know, I can't speak to that uh, to that situation at this stage. Just showing, kind of, to your point, the lack of clarity on exactly what it's going to look like going forward. <laughs> it's not open. The other side is not open. Um, and the people in Gaza do not have anywhere to go. The Israelis have said they are going to try to warn people when they bomb, but we were talking to a, a doctor inside Gaza last night who said the warning amounts to a sort of a first tap, a quote-unquote small rocket, warning people, and hopefully they can get out in time before the big ones, the big bombs come down and, and, and level the, uh, the, the buildings, which is what's happened. Uh, there are, according to the UN, some 150 or so thousand Gazans who've already taken refuge at UN facilities, including UNRWA, as it's called, schools and other such facilities. But that's only a small uh, percentage. And I think, really, it, it goes to the question that, that Sarah also asked, what is the end game? Because is, for instance, Hamas setting up traps for Israeli forces, as has been warned? Does it want to try to drag Israel into a quagmire? Does it want to spark a regional conf conflagration by uh, doing this? And more importantly, even if Israel manages to decimate Hamas, then who takes over? Does Israel reoccupy? Who then? What then? There's so many questions. But Israel's aim right now should not be misunderstood. It is to retain and regain, rather, the deterrence that it has lost since Saturday.